Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by our old friend, Mr. Rob Hart of robhartdrumstudio.com. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Uh, amazing to be here again after uh, many obstacles. And um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, yes. It's, it's amazing that we, we, you know, the planets aligned. We had a full, you know, uh, a lunar eclipse, solar eclipse that we were able to meet today. That's what did it. And, and yeah, cause, cause Rob has been uh, very closely, uh, you know, in tune with what's been happening with my attic renovation and Hey, we can do it. Wait, we can't do it. Wait, I'm traveling out. I've been traveling out close to Rob's, uh, neck of the woods. I go to Sausalito pretty regularly for work and he's in San Francisco. And, um, but it just, I'm there very quickly and we have yet to link up there, but we will. And, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be spending my, uh, my afternoon with you today um, because we have been doing, I think we originally started calling it like the mentors series where you had a series of um, videos that you sent me and we've broken it up into, we did a Steve Smith episode, which people can check out. We did a Mike Clark episode. Today we are going to be doing uh, Robbie Gonzalez and all these people. Oh, and also we did a Tony Williams episode about um, a clinic that you uh, f- recorded back in 1982. Was yeah, that it was, it was? Uh, it was actually that podcast was, um, I took lessons in San Francisco from him yeah. at the old drum world. Um, and then there was a clinic that was at Wurlitzer music, um, that John D. Christopher actually worked there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wurlitzer and, and on, uh, I think it was, um, Boylston. Mass Ave. And um, they had a bunch of clinics, you know, Peter Erskine, Lenny White. Tony did one of those in that clinic series. Yeah. And so we all sure. recorded it. And that's where I, I took a bunch of stuff, but they were actually mixed. It was yeah. it was both my private lessons and uh, le- uh, that clinic. Which it was super cool. And so the the vibe of uh, w- what we're doing with Rob here is uh, if you haven't heard an episode with Rob so far, one of the three or four that we've done so far is he has clips that he presents. And it's a super cool way for us to um, kind of check out these, these examples. And then he can, Rob talks about kind of uh, his firsthand experience with these drummers. And today we're talking about Robbie Gonzalez, who was Berkeley professor, uh, played with Al Dimiola. You took lessons with him. So before we kind of jump into the clips and all that good stuff, Rob, tell us about your connection with Robbie Gonzalez and maybe tell people who he is because he kind of falls into that unsung hero uh, category a little bit where he's not quite as much of a household name as the, you know, Steve Gads of the world. Um, so tell us who Robbie is. So Robbie, um, is a, um, very unique drummer that uh, was born in Tampa, Florida. Um, he um, actually, his dad had, uh, I guess his dad was a drummer and his dad would, would take him around when he was a little kid um, to all these drum camps and everything. So um, he actually did a master class with Gene Krupa when he was like, eight or something like that, seven or eight. Like he attended it as a student as, as like, it was like, you know, a group of, of kids. Yeah, sure. And his dad took him to that. Um, he said he also did, um, um, lessons with Joe Morello too, you know, as a very young kid. Um, so he was, you know, in his family, he was a, you know, part of his, I guess, uh, you know, childhood was just playing all the time, kind of like Steve Gadd, you know, you, 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 your parents are influencing you and then you grow up playing. So, um, he had a, a Latin type of background. So he had this natural thing of being, you know, a Latin, um, type of drummer, you know, um, and, um, and then of course all the rudiments. So, um, he had super, super ability. Now, um, when I met him, he had just gotten off the road with, um, Al Dimiola and Al Dimiola at the time was probably, you know, the, one of the big fusion gigs, um, which Al Dimiola would did, you know, uh, he did like, 
I guess you'd say a lot of flamenco and Latin and, and, and then, you know, hardcore fusion and all that, um, as part of, of this touring act. Um, sure. So he had just gotten off the road. That was part of, I think, RTF was one of my big influences, you know, Ma Vishnu and all, all the stuff that was happening at the time, 11th House. And, and so that was like a huge thing for me. So at Berkeley, um, what would happen is um, there was practice rooms. And um, the practice rooms were um, basically new. They were like refrigerator types of uh, practice rooms that were um, newly constructed, and there would be a lot of famous drummers that would come through, and Robbie pretty much would come through the rooms like kind of offering lessons. Now a lot of these guys would come into your room and play for you, and like maybe give you like a I don't like a taste of what they do. So when I heard Robbie play. And he came in the room and, and um, there, was, there was like, I was instantly blown away. It was like mm. an instant connection of like, oh yeah, this is what I, this is what I'm looking for. And just like we're talking about the mentor series, you kind of, the mentor kind of finds you. And, and, and so there's like a connection and, and then you, um, you both have that, you know, mentor kind of student relationship. So, you know, he comes from this this background of of you know upbringing of only doing drums. Is another thing I wanted to say is like no tunnel. It was like no uh, uh, we say distractions. You know, it's like you only do one thing. He comes up. He was destined to be this great musician, and then he gets all these great gigs, and then um, you know I happen to connect with him. Now at the time in Boston, there was a trumpet player. His name was uh, Tiger Akashi, and, and the gig was called Tiger's Baku. So all the big name uh, players in Boston were doing this gig. So um, after Al Viola, Robbie was doing this gig with Tiger, and that was in Boston. So mm. um, that's another connection there, which oh, like cool. everybody did that gig, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I even talked to my friends from Berkeley um, there's another um, uh, big name drummer, Robbie. I'm uh, sorry, um, Marty Richards. And Marty, um, you know, played with um, a bunch of great guys in, in uh, uh, Boston, and ended up getting the Gary Burton gig, which kind of sent him off the maps. But he also played with the guy with Joe Perry from Aerosmith, and oh, did all wow. these great gigs. Yeah. But everybody kind of that was your thing. You went through the uh, uh, Tiger Tiger's Baku gig, you know, and That's that a led cool to a bunch of other things. Well, okay, and and um, clearly his his pedigree of being at Berkeley and performing with these there, there's something about fusion drummers that I think uh, fusion and jazz you really typically know your stuff to be hanging and playing in those genres. Where rock, yes, there's so many phenomenal rock and roll drummers, but you can also be more of the and I love him, but like you can be a little more like Ringo, where you're not probably considered like a fusion, you know, absolute, you know time bending kind of drummer but fusion you typically know your uh your your fundamentals very well and can and build up can build on it there um so i'm excited to hear more about him but i've got a folder of about nine clips that you sent uh of of robbie playing kate before we start jumping in here i know one of them the first one if you want to go in this order is with aldi miola but what what are most of these clips from like what is the recordings uh from why don't you kind of set it up before we jump into the clips. Okay. So after we hooked up at Berkeley in the, in the, the practice rooms and I, I kind of took him on as being, you know, uh, my mentor and teacher, um, we had a house, um, that was, a, a, a duplex in Alston, which was next to, uh, Boston university, uh, down, it was about probably, I'd say like, um, a, 15 minute drive from Boston from, mm -hmm. from Berkeley, I should say. And, um, this house had a basement and the basement, I always say it was like, uh, you know, an old, um, uh, steam boiler, you know, that was, you know, that central heating. And I always say it's very dangerous and dusty and all that stuff down there. It's probably very toxic. It's like, yeah. you know, it had these big oil tanks that you would fill it up and, yeah. Um, so that was our rehearsal space, right? 
Because if we were upstairs, we'd bug the roommates. Everybody would start yelling at each other and all that stuff. I call this place the, uh, the, the house, the hell of the, the legend of Hell House, because, you know, everything was chaos there. Roommates <laughs> yeah. were coming and going. And the yeah. whole idea of having this house was to, to have all musicians and be able to practice and all that. But soon we all got on each other's nerves. So, yeah. The basement seemed the place to be. The basement seems to be the place where we could rehearse and practice without pissing everybody off, and that's where we did these lessons. So again, I had the little tape recorder, you know, the Sony, you know, uh, uh, Sony recorder, and uh, Robbie was actually the first one to say, like, "Hey, you need to record all this stuff." You know, do you get that? And so. Um, he would be initiating like, okay, record these ideas. I'm, I'm going to play for you so you can practice them. Now, before that, everything was written down. Like everybody would have a notebook and I don't know when you, you take lessons and traditionally nothing was recorded. It was always, here's the book. You're going to do this page. Um, here's yeah. your lesson assignment, you know, A, B, remember, and C, and D. Just remember what I taught you. That's how it was right. when I was a kid. And then, I, right. and then you get home and you're like, uh, wait, what? And you practice it incorrectly. Right. Or, you know, you know, here, play, play these things in like the syncopation book, like, you know, page, whatever, and then come back and play for your teacher. And he gives you the next page or makes you do it again. So Robbie's thing was he, he didn't write things down, but he would do this recording. And so all these recordings, which I found, and, and it's a miracle, you know, I know you talked about recording drums in your last mm -hmm. video. Um, yeah in your last podcast, I had these tapes. Now, I don't know how I have the tapes and I saved them, but tape doesn't deteriorate for some reason. So these cassettes from, you know, 19, it was probably 1983 or something like that. You know, everything still is good, right? So I transfer that onto digital and all these tapes are from my lessons, right? Hmm. That are still yeah. They're still great today. Now, the quality is, you know, iffy, but um, it's not distorting. It's, 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 you know, uh, it's audible. We'll just put it that way. But um, yeah. here it is, you know, you document the stuff without even knowing it, you know, of tapes. Yeah. And then. Well, that's, that's actually an interesting point. It's unrelated to this, but I'll just say real quick that there must be something about the cassette tape uh, kind of uh, whatever that material that it's made of versus like Ampex, like two inch magnetic tape because that I remember back with JP tack at the studio, we would have to bake it. You'd have it. We'd have a little oven that you'd have to put it in and bake the tape to get it warmed up. So it would actually kind of not, it would not get shredded when you pulled it off. Cause it stuck. It like got, you know, stuck to itself, but these are cassette tapes. So thank God right. you did it with that. And uh, you can just pop it in and it just plays right away. Yeah. That's amazing. Isn't it? It, yeah, it, it, yeah. it pops in, it plays. And, you know, tapes used to get, um, there would be a thing where they get cut up in the capstan wheel and they would yes. break, you know, or, <laughs> you know, that yeah. whole mess. Yeah. But, you know, um, this, this um, you know, out of sheer luck, all those tapes were preserved. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and um, and that's an amazing thing. So, um, so well, why don't you set up our first one here? I mean, okay. so, so which one do you want to start with? We've got, I've got them in order here, but num you want to start with number one, Robbie with, uh, Al Di Miola. Yeah. Let's start with that. Okay. So let's check this out. I think it's about two and a half minutes and then we'll talk about it and just keep chugging forward. So, uh, here's Robbie Gonzalez with Al Di Miola. <laughs> Thank you. 
pretty amazing. And, and I want to explain for people who are not watching on YouTube that the Timbales, that was Al Di Miola playing on the Timbales. And man, he's pretty darn good, too. I mean, he sounded amazing. Yeah, the other thing, you know, with, with Al Di Miola is, um, you know, he's an Italian, you know, grew up, I think, in New Jersey. But he talks about how we would go um, into New York and kind of hang out at these Latin clubs, right? Mm. And, sure. and and that's how he got all that influence, right? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so he, he kind of learned percussion just from hanging out, right? Yeah. And, and uh, Which it that, is great. They, they played well together. They played super well together. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing that, um, and I guess this is true with like Frank Zappa uh, as well, is when they rehearsed, they would rehearse for like eight hours a day. And I think you would go, like, I, I think Robbie was telling me, like, you'd go, like, five or six days a week, like, before a Jeez. tour. Wow. And and so it was, like, super tight. And the music is hard, you know? Yeah. Um, the other thing Robbie told me is that he had to learn all those. Steve Steve Gadd played on all those records, you know, with Al Miola. Mm. So he had to actually learn Steve Gadd's parts. That's tough. So imagine that. <laughs> yeah yeah really and and i mean that's that's even a conversation in itself of like yes playing parts that that are very well like you know of steve gadd or steve jordan or someone who's like an incredible session drummer who maybe doesn't want to go out on the road with them but like there's big shoes to fill just in general of like this this amazing band leader is like used to playing with this person so you kind of have to like step up your game but that's that's how you get that's how you get bigger gigs is just doing that. So that's, that's, uh, he's not the first to do that. You know what I mean? Fill in in a big, big drummer's shoes, particularly Steve Gadd. I'm sure lots of people had to do that. Right. What's your takeaway from seeing that? Does that reflect Robbie's style really well? Um, you know, he got way better in my opinion. Um, obviously he got, uh, an, a Yamaha endorsement and I think Zildjian endorsement, um, that to me is, you know, maybe the start, he's probably a younger, you know, probably in his, I don't know, I'm not going to say an age, but he was probably younger at that point. Um, and then I think as far as his style goes, um, it got better and better and better, like his phrasing and, and, um, you know, his ideas and his, his kind of, you know, creativity. Cause I always felt that he had a certain creativity, you know, a modern approach that I didn't hear anybody doing. You know, there was, yeah. there was, you know, I call drum licks, you know, there's certain things like learn this lick because that was part of his lessons. It wasn't like do, do page 37 in syncopation. It was more like, here's this idea and I want you to play it exactly how, is, how I'm teaching it to you. So I just felt like, um, you know, as he went on, his, his concept got like, you know, more refined and, and, uh, you know, it, it just, it was, it got, um, how would I put that? It, it was such a modern approach that was so fresh and nobody was doing at the time. Yeah. What year was that? I think you said it before, but what year was this concert with Al Miola? I believe it was around 77 or 78. Okay. But, but it, um, I have yeah. to go back and look. And I believe that song was called The Wizard. It's on YouTube. Okay. But, um, I have to go back. And, <laughs> I know there was a couple. I believe it was the wizard. Okay. All right, uh, Rob, let's jump ahead to the next clip, unless there's anything else you want to talk about on that one. No, I think that was just a, um, you know, something that's documented of that time. Yes. Um, of that tour yep. that, that he did. All right. So next we have Robbie Gonzalez. This is um, labeled as Latin. So maybe explain this a little before we start and we'll listen to this clip. So, um, as I was mentioned before, I think Robbie had a, um, you know, a certain thing that he did. He could play rudiments very well. Um, as far as my thing, my feet were always really bad. He really got me into lifting my heel on my left foot, um, you know, more accuracy and, and articulation with the feet. So, um, a lot of times when we grow up, we, we work on rudiments in our hands, but we don't really incorporate our feet. So sure. he's got this thing that he does that um, he's got the Latin flavor and he's got the intense, let's say like 
uh, coordination with the hands and feet. And uh, like I said, he has that modern approach, you know? So gotcha. that's pretty much what this clip, um, you know, really showcases. Okay, let's check this out. Uh, now this is Robbie Gonzalez, Latin. Cowbell used like that very like correctly and smooth can be the coolest thing in the world. I love that. Yeah. And, and there's a, a, just a really great example of, like I'd say the, the coordination, everything's just really articulate, you know, real smooth, um, real hip, you know? So, I mean, to me, that was just so, it, it was just blew me away. Like be in the yeah. room with that. And, and uh, yeah. of course, you know, when I say, when I was a kid, you know, we really didn't want to do anything else. We only wanted to do music and that was our driving force. So to see somebody like that, you know, with like doing it was just so inspirational. Yeah. Well, and, and by that, you mean someone who was focused more on the art and practice of his craft on the drum set, as opposed to just playing in bands and things like that. Is that kind of what you mean? Well, the fact that you dedicate your life to something, I see. Like I was saying, um, you know, his dad bringing him up. Let's say that you you play music when you're a, a kid, and then you you kind of drop it, right? Sure. You you you, you do something else. You become a, a, a you know physicist or something like that. Like <laughs> he just he just did that. You know, he just he just took it to a new level. Yeah. And um, I want to mention too, he got a lot of great gigs before he even did the Aldemiola thing. Um, Apparently, um, he hung out with uh, Ralph McDonald. He was saying he, he, he was bowling and invited Ralph McDonald. And that Steve Jordan, Steve Jordan uh, recommended him for um, a gig with Nardo Michael Walden, where he hmm. played drums behind Nardo Michael Walden. Um, wow. Just all these things that, that I think he was living the life of, of like, you know, um, being a musician and, and getting gigs. And then one gig led to another gig and, and having referrals. Um, it was all word of mouth. Yeah. So I mean, that's when how, I say that's that, how it it's all like, works. yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like having, having a, a, a connection, you know, having the goods and being referred and people, people enjoying you or liking you, um, you know, impressing people. And, and so, um, that, that kind of thing to me was, you know, living it and, 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 um, you know, having, having that connection and, um, you know, networking and all that, that, that yeah. to me was like, oh yeah, this is, this is it right here. He's, he's, he's living the dream. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's hop into our next one here. Next up we have a uh, swing Robbie Gonzalez. So let's listen to it. Uh, and then we'll talk about it after. So here's swing.
he was playing, you know, he had this, this thing that he would do uh, with just playing the, the, the swing ostinato, um, but doing these things with triplets over it, you know, so quarter note triplets and you do like groups of two groups of four. So you play like two groups on your snare drum, two groups on your bass drum. And then um, he does four groups. So it's like these polyrhythmic things. And then of course, uh, doing different rudiment um, ideas over that. Right. All and yep. triplets all swinging. Yep. Um, so it wasn't, you know, how would I put that? It, 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 it was, it was um, all very formulated. It wasn't so much just, he was improvising, but it, you know, these ideas were, were um, uh, very beautiful phrases. Sure. Right. Yeah. And, and that um, seems like stuff that like you may not go and sit down and play with a band and do that exact same thing, but there's like stuff that you do in the practice room. Like, it seems like he's very good at having his things that to, to practice. And then he knows what to take and put on the stage. Yeah. And, and having, you know, just having that, um, I guess the ability and, and, and the technique and, and the, um, you know, uh, um, independence to be able to pull certain things off, you yeah. know, um, yeah. which, some of those things are, I mean, my roommate and I were, were, were doing these, these, um, exercises. I mean, they're hard, you know, they're, they're hard. They take a lot of practice and, sure. and they usually, they can fall apart pretty easily. So to be able to make those clean is, is just a lot of work. Yep. Yep. Which, you know, you got to put in the work if you want to, <laughs> if you want to learn stuff. So, um, all right. Very true. Let's hop to the next one and keep chugging. Um, this is Robbie G, as you have it labeled, Lick in 7. Sound good? Okay. All right, here we go. Lick in 7. That was really cool. I mean, Rob, let me ask you from your experience working with Robbie and all these great guys, do you have maybe after listening to that, like something that you've picked up from all these people of like how to get more comfortable playing in let's say seven. Cause like you, it's an uncomfortable, you have to get used to it. Like what did, what did Robbie kind of, I'm sure you already were pretty good at it, but what did Robbie, what advice did he give you on kind of maintaining that, that pattern and not losing it and staying comfortable? I don't think we ever covered that. You know, I think mm. you just, um, in my experience, there was just, uh, you know, there'd be like different tunes in an odd time, you know? Um, and then we would, um, basically f you would count it first. And, um, 
And then after a while, you start to feel it. Just so, kind of make it a pa- make it a pattern in your brain, and then just like get used to it, kind of. Yeah, you you'd get the the pattern or the phrase of of let's say like the bass line or the you know the the, the rhythm motif, and then from there, um, you know you you have a, a beat or groove or pattern you're playing, and then um, try to start to do fills, you know, and start to incorporate being able to get, get in and out of it. Um, sure. I think with with Robbie, we didn't do much of that, but he was just demonstrating an idea. Now, in that idea, he just played. He's doing fives in there too. He's 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 doing different things. He's not just in seven, but you know the main sure. idea was in seven. Um, yeah. So I think with like when when I was doing um, different kinds of odd times, let's say with Steve Smith, you know we were we would work on a song that would be in. And, and seven and then um you know different phrases um the the michael walden thing I, we went to a, there was another guy that that you know was amazing at odd times who felt it right and he had a thing where you would count in half time so you'd count like seven you'd count one two one two three one two mm. one two three and he had different um different kinds of ways of breaking it down that way um, which actually helped me a lot. Now, when I was 17 yeah. years old, I went to that, uh, the, you know, Michael Walden did a, a clinic, and which changed my life. But that was one of the things. He would do all these crazy odd times and solo over it. But he had this system of breaking it down. Now, where he got that from, maybe it was from John McLaughlin, who knows. But um, I think those things started to help, like the how you break down the phrasing. And then um, after a while, you feel it. Right. Yeah. And then you yeah. don't really have to count anymore. Yeah. Cause at first it's, I mean, I, I'm kind of out of practice with odd time signature stuff at this point, but it's like, it can be maddening just to be the counting. And then, and then you, you th- overthink everything, but it seems like once you really get that understanding and that you get more freedom, love that. Very cool. Now the next one we have is Gaddish groove, meaning Steve Gad, a, a Gad like groove. So let's check this one out. And I'm excited to hear this because, again, Robbie Gonzalez filling in after Steve Gadd recorded the Al Miola tracks. So he, I'm sure he had a good understanding of what a Gadd uh, groove was. So let's listen to this one and then uh, we'll talk about it. That was like, if you closed your eyes or didn't look at a picture of Robbie, that was very gad, gadish, you know, <laughs> at first. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, he, he, he definitely had that, like he was breaking down the, the, the pattern. So this is the other thing that the way that he taught, he could play it like half time or slow it down and then go back to, um, you know, the, the playing at normal speed. So that was pretty amazing that you could actually do that, go back and forth. You would, you know, switch from, from, you know, um, 
doing it up to tempo and then half timing it or slowing it down is going back and forth. So you got the, it's like, you got the lick, here's the sticking. And and you'd have to learn that stuff, you know, verbatim with the stickings and everything. And I think it was like a, it's, it's a paradiddle. I'm not, I'm not going to like jump on myself here, but it's some sort of paradiddle in there. And uh, with the open hi-hat and the thing I talked about with the feet, the, the hi-hat's exactly opening and closing perfectly. Right. Yeah, he's got, like he's got that and thing just perfectly executed, and that's so Steve got that little just kind of like it almost, but it's like it, it, it's not, but it almost sounds in a way almost like it's so laid back or like I don't want to say sloppy, but it's not. It's like this certain kind of like like and I, and I can visualize videos of from like drummer world of like Steve Gad old lessons of him doing it, and he's like seems so relaxed when he's doing it. You know what I mean? And you can hear that in his playing. That's there's something to that the the gad the gaddishness <laughs> of it that's yeah. I think Steve Gad um and again I grew up with all that. That was my childhood um cuz he was on all the records. Mm-hmm. Um but he had a thing that was his style and you knew it was him. The way he recorded his drums, the way his drums sounded, his cymbals sounded, um, you know, the, the ideas that he would play. And, you know, he would, he would play like you knew like these ideas, you know, they would come up in, in different recordings and you knew it was him, right? Sure. So, um, you know, the phrasing, it wasn't just improvising like let's say – uh, like a, an Elvin Jones where, you know, you, you know, it was Elvin, but you know, it's more free and whatnot. Like this stuff was like, it was worked out, but it was, you know, very exact. And the phrasing, you know, like he never would do something that was, you know, not meant to be played. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. it exactly. was, it was the phrasing that was so beautiful that was meant to be played for that particular part and that particular yeah. song. Uh, and a true a true master makes it seem easy, even though right. it's not easy. It's like watching right. a great athlete or whoever. It's just like, wow, that looks so effortless. But then I go and try and slam dunk, and it's not happening, <laughs> right? <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And and the time, like this time, was so good, right? So Steve Gadd's yeah. just in that yes. was there wasn't you weren't playing with clicks. I mean, that was something that was new, right? That that we sure. didn't we were not able to do that. Most people that would, I'm sure when you were doing studio sessions, would like go, okay, you're going to put this to a click, and then people would fail. Um, uh, Steve yeah. Gadd was able to do that back in the 70s. And, and um, you know, he was able to do, you know, read really well and able to do things fast because time yeah. was money. And if you didn't, if you weren't able to, uh, uh, record a track within, you know, one or two takes, I mean, you're out. Right. Yeah. And I always, there's always the stories too, of like, uh, you know, Zeppelin, like ramble on or something where it would be like, they'd record like a track of like playing like a on like a guitar case or something, which stayed in, but they would give themselves like a guide track, but it's not to a click. It would be like them that it would be like Bonham or whoever recording that guide and then they record over it but it's it's just interesting that's a part of recording drum history that we didn't even talk about but um yeah gad was clearly ahead of the time by having this just great sense of time built in and i think that a lot of the rock and roll bands or or uh, you know a lot of history of, of recording um in in those days in the 70s 60s 70s they didn't use a click no so, not at all so a lot of times stuff was moving you know, Led Zeppelin and whatnot, you know, the, the, it felt great, you know, and that's, we know yeah. that as, you know, history, but, you know, when the click started coming in, when they said, you know, we want this to be exact, you know, um, you, you only had a few guys that could actually play to a click and, yeah. and, and, you know, almost bury it like a Vinnie Caliuta, Steve Gadd, you know, yes. a lot of these guys that were doing the studio work. I mean, you didn't even know that click was there. They were so exact with it. It's scary. Yeah. It's like the click is when you get in that mode of being of burying the click, it's like the click is gone. And then for a minute, you're like, wait, did they turn the click off? But like when you get on, it's like, oh, yeah, this is this is what it's supposed to be like. That's that's every day for those guys. Um, All right. That was awesome. Let's go to uh, Robbie Gonzalez melodic groove next. Uh, Here's this one.
cool. He was really breaking it down and working, working through it. You know, that was, that was a real, uh, that was, that was cool to hear that very much cl- classic lesson stuff. Yeah. That was probably one of my favorites out of, out of the, all the clips, just because the idea is so cool. Right. And yeah. you had to hit the exact Tom too, by the way. So it was like, you had to play the series. Now I, as I remember, I think that was my slingling set. That's on my, I think it's on, if you see it's over my uh, left shoulder, um, sure. you know, it's, it's, it's back then. I didn't really know what I was doing with tuning, you know, um, <laughs> our drum, our drum sound was like what it was at the time, but you know, he just made those drums sound great. The way yeah. that he played the instrument, the way he, he hit, you know, um, you know, the touch of his, you know, of touching the, the instrument, his touch and, and, uh, um, you know, making the instrument sound so full, um, and I just, I, I always loved that, you know, the way you hit the serenum, the way you hit the toms, um, you know, the force, the tone, um, the touch, uh, yeah. the sensitivity. Um, so to me, that was just so amazing. Now he would slow it down like I was talking about and, and then go, okay, here's the pattern exactly. And then he'd go back in the tempo. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but the phrasing again, it's just like, that is so cool. Um, yeah. I, I want to talk about a little bit about how like with Instagram and all that stuff, you kind of see like I see all these really great videos and I, I, I do love them all. But um, there's not this type of stuff. I don't I don't see like I mean, there's there's these cool ideas, but you're not getting this thing where they're playing this phrase that is so beautiful. It's like this a uh, more of, of like a gospel chops thing. I don't know chop, if you want to, yeah, if you want to like it's, comment on that, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. When people kind of rip on it and say like, Oh, gospel chops, that's just G chops. I'm like, yeah, but it's really hard and it's really impressive. I get that. It's sort of like, it's maybe not. And then people go, Oh, you don't use that in a song. So I don't think it's fair to rip on it, but I think maybe the gospel chop shredding, it's like, uh, will some of those amazing drummers fall apart when they're playing a little bit if you slow it down and do these kind of melodic grooves? Maybe, but but again, maybe you just don't post that stuff because you don't think it's as impressive or it will get as many likes. So I don't know. That's a good that's a good point. You know, I want to um, make a comment. I watched this um, Justin Timberlake live on Tiny Tiny Desk. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They, they I haven't seen like, that. Was I heard it was awesome. Oh, it's awesome. It's amazing. And um, <laughs> they had like a horn section and they had like, I think two keyboard players and like two guitar players. I mean, they barely fit, you know? Yeah. And and um, the drummer, um, you could tell he was a gospel chops drummer. And he really played the gig well. He, he, he like, he had his little like... Um, sampling pad he played all the parts exactly but for a second he played some of that stuff just for like a second you know like they gave him like a feature and you could tell like he could do that stuff but he yeah. really played the gig i really recommend that um video i it just blew me away like pop wise right sure like sure. playing for the gig playing the right thing for the gig but having that ability to do it Right. A lot of the gospel chop guys, which again, we're talking about like the linear kind of, we're talking about the linear kind of fills that, that happen a lot, which, um, which is really, really popular. But a lot of those guys you see playing with the like major, major pop stars of, of, of our time now, because it seems to fit with that kind of music. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's unbelievable and I, I will watch that. I'm glad you recommended it. Um, so, all right, Rob, we're, we got two more here and we're actually lining up. This is, this is perfect timing. So, um, the next one we have is paradiddle funk, which I'm excited to hear. Uh, so let's check out Robbie Gonzalez paradiddle funk.
you really got going there. Yeah. <laughs> he beautiful? speeds up. It's like, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Love it. So um, incorporating paradiddles, um, which is kind of almost a, I always call it like a, you know, it is the first rudiment you learn. And um, yet there's so much stuff you can do with it. You know, the four, yeah. I call it the paradiddle family, you know, the single, the double, the triple, and the paradiddle diddle. So he uses yep. them all there in different kinds of phrasings, very clean, you know, very melodic, you know, very hip. Yeah. Um, really, when you when you hear it, you wouldn't like, again, if I, I didn't read paradiddle funk, I you, I don't immediately hear do da do do da do da da do da do do da do da da. You're not. It's so smooth. You're not hearing paradiddles, really. Like you are when he breaks it into the ride and stuff to some degree. But like just on the snare, he's so clean and even and level. It's it's really really good. Yeah, he's doing a lot of different accents and ghost notes and you know the phrasing. So yeah, you, you know it that it's a paradiddle. But again, you know it's so musical that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and the bell of the, the the ride and all that it's just so musical you know it's so cool so hip what kind of ride was that do you remember oh you know what um i think i had a rock it was called a rock 21 and zildjian made it hmm. and it was really hard to get i i remember i have a weird story and maybe i told you this but um when I gave, when Tony Williams had a, a the, when he has funeral in San Francisco, I gave Armand Zildjian a ride to his hotel room, and Craigie Zildjian and and I think John De Christopher were sitting on my trap case in the back of my van, and I asked Armand, I go like, it was so hard to get these symbols when I was a kid. And he goes, oh yeah, we're back ordered. And uh, I had to like wait a, a year to get that symbol. Wow! And and it had like a big bell, and I love that huh. thing. You know, it was it was pingy. You know, it was kind of a yeah. You know, real real. You know, that type of of a Zildjian pingy ride. But that bell, man, it just cut. You know, yeah. I just love that thing. I don't know what man. happened to it. I get. I I I guess I sold it. I <laughs> like some of these symbols. Is like whatever happened to that guy? I, <laughs> I, yeah, I have stuff where I'm like. I'm immediately kind of like, wait, did I lend that to someone? Wait, did I sell that? Wait, did I lose it? Did I leave it at a gig? Where after a couple of years, I'm like, okay, I'm just, I can't remember at all what I've <laughs> done with, done with this thing. So you wait, Armin Zildjian, Craigie Zildjian, and John DeChristopher in the back of your van hanging out. That's a pretty cool. Uh, so, hang. so here's here's what happened. So I was teaching uh, Troy Lucetta, who played in a band called Tesla. Oh yeah, yeah. And and I told Troy, um, this was like what nineteen, whatever that was, ninety seven when he passed away. Yeah. Um, I told Troy, I go, let's go. And Troy's like, I don't really know Tony Williams, you know. And I go, come on, man, let's just go. So I got him to go with me. So he was, he's an a Zildjian endorser. Everybody was there. Everybody was there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And At so Tony's funeral. Tony's funeral. Tony's right? funeral. It's packed. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Steve. Uh, what was it? Uh, Steve Smith, um, Mike, uh, Scott Morris. So we'll do the next uh, podcast on. Um, you, you had uh, Stanley Clark. You had Wayne Shorter. Uh, you know, everybody was there. Uh, Wallace Roney. You know, uh, uh, Ron Carter. Like, just the thing was just who's who, right? So then we're yeah. coming out, and uh, um, Troy's like, "Oh, you know, these guys need a ride to the hotel room." And then I go, okay, so we took him to the St. Francis. If you know San Francisco, is like the kind of the big hotel in, in San Francisco and on California Street. Sure. So here we are, like, okay, well, like I don't. I took the seats out of the back of my van. Like you can sit on my trap case. About the trap case the, lived in the van. Like I did not take it out unless I had to set up. It was, yeah. It was Me, the Zildjian family basically was sitting the in the Zildjian back of Zildjian family. Your- yeah. <laughs> And I wow. actually um, at at the um, PASIC we went to. I was uh, I was actually going to ask because they had uh, the 400th anniversary of uh, Zildjian, and I was yeah. going to ask Craigie. I was going to go up to her, but I, I didn't get a chance. I actually talked to the other, you know, the sister, but um, I didn't Debbie. get a chance to, to to talk to her. Yeah, that's funny. Be like, do you remember being in the back of my van in 1997? <laughs> J- uh, John D. Christopher remembers. That's, that's how, funny. Yeah. Wow. Well, John, John is a great, me- he has a great memory for all this stuff. And, and I love, 
I like it when people are like, it, which I've found to be true where a lot of people remember these small kind of little details throughout their career because, you know, you take for, sometimes you think, oh, they won't remember, but when they do, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's cause it's, I, I would certainly remember that, uh, experience. So very cool. All right, Rob, well, let's kind of close things out here. The last one we're going to listen to is Robbie Gonzalez soloing hat pattern. Um, let's check this out and then we'll talk about it and we'll close things out for today. Uh, so here is this last clip. Talk about independence right there. Yeah, I think that one, and I was trying to remember, I think he had me play some pattern and then he would solo over it. So I was I was like playing the hi-hat or something like that. Okay. You and were then, playing the hi-hat in that. I, that think, was you playing I think that's the, what okay, it was. I was, like, I was like, dear God, he's got like, he's the most steady, most independent. Right. Uh, it sounded like two people. That was yeah. nuts. Okay. Yeah, I that think makes more that's sense. what that was. And I'm, I'm, I think he said, play this. And then he kind of stopped and he went back to like play the pattern and he played a little bit and then he'd solo over it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Cause I was like, is he doing this with his foot? Cause there's some things where I'm like, this is not, it doesn't sound physically possible. That's cool though. That's very, he sounds like a very great teacher, uh, which just because you're a phenomenal drummer who understands all this, you know, uh, who has a great, uh, understanding of the instrument doesn't mean you're a great teacher. It seems like he really gets how to translate this to a student. I got to say, Robbie, you know, um, just with, you know, being, uh, you know, a person like this, just having that, you know, he was a super guy and, and um, you know, we would hang out. So the lessons consisted of, you know, doing um, whatever it was, an hour, two hours, and then going out to a club and hanging out. Mm. There was a, a local club, a rock club there in Boston or Austin. We go, we go hang out. We go have dinner. Um, so there was a lot of social parts to it, you know, where you had, um, you know, the the personal connection. It wasn't just like, okay, here's the lesson. See you later. Bye. You know, next. You know, you, it was like, you know, it was like an, a day. It was like a day. You know, it was like hours of of hanging out and 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 like yeah. just just you know. Um, you know, having that inspiration as a human being, you know, um, getting uh, to know people, social skills. A lot skills. of sense. Yeah, you. But I would. I've done the the episodes where we talked about Freddie Gruber, uh, Joe Morello, uh, various others, a ton of other ones. Where, for the most part, people be like, "Yeah, we would do a lesson, and it would be two hours, and then we'd go hang out." And I mean, but sometimes you'd have to stack lessons. And how, I mean, how many students would Robbie have at one time? Like. You I know, don't, on his, I don't on his think roster. He, I don't think he had the traditional way of, of um, you know, doing a, um, a teaching roster. I think it was more like, okay, we're going to do it today kind of thing. And, and so he was, he'd be doing this gig, you know, he was in Boston doing the gig and then he'd go, okay, you know, you'd have that lesson that was um, pretty much like your whole day, you know? Uh, so, so you're more of like, like a four hours or something like that, you know, you're like a pupil. 
you're you're less than you're it's less like here's a half hour hour lesson i gotta be done at two because my next one's at 2 30 or what or, or or i'm done at what i'm done at two the next one starts at two it's more right. like all right let's take our time that's that's just very unique and different than the way i used to do it which i which think most that's the people way to do go. It. Like as a business, yeah, like you, you, know, you, you do you, it. I'm sure. I mean, you have a lesson coming up here soon. <laughs> That's the yeah. way you do. So yeah, you have your your, you know, your roster of the day. You know, and uh, everybody's got a slot. You know, so it's yeah. not a really traditional way of doing lessons. But man, it's great for me. I was like, I dug it. You know, I dug yeah. being around him. He was so cool, and he was like, he was a hip hip guy and great. You know, just a you know great mentor and and. Um, you know, I think like the social thing is really important. You know, that's another thing I think younger people need to learn about. That is kind of half of, of, of doing music is is the hang, right? And if you're Absolutely. able to hang out with people and people like you, man, you got the gig, you know? Totally. It's not always how well you play, you know? It's, it's like, can people get along with you? Are you, you know, socially, uh, you know, are you easy to get along with, you know? People like yes. you. I think that is a big part of you know, what we learned, you know, the, the, the hanging out part of it. That's like, but that's not just drumming. That's any job, anything, any, anything it's, can I, can I get along with you? Can I hang out with you? Can you just chill? Can you know when not to play? It's all that stuff. Um, so what is Robbie doing, uh, these days? He's pretty much retired. Um, he was man, he's in New York. He was managing some, um, I think an apartment building. Okay. But he's pretty much retired. He just turned 70. Okay, yeah. So that was like a big a big milestone for him. Sure. Well, I'm sure people are grateful to hear about his story and can uh, dig deeper into his you know discography and check that all out. Um, but as we mentioned at the beginning, robhartdrumstudio.com. Rob, as we close things out, why don't you tell people uh, again, because we've talked about it on our our, our other episodes that we've done, which I'll link in the description here, but kind of tell people more about your, your drum studio and taking lessons with you and uh, how that all works, either if they're in the Bay area or online, um, which you're, you're very well set up to do. So um, yeah, what's tell us about where they can find you all that good stuff. Well, during the pandemic, I did um, a whole online um, uh, lesson course. So I did like, you know, hours and hours and hours of, of lessons that I edited. We talked about that in like our first podcast, like I did, you know, um, making like editing down like hours of video, which was not fun, but I, I got all that yeah. stuff done. I have a very uh, in-depth lesson course that's on Rob Hart, uh, uh, drum studio.com. And then um, people, if they're in the area, they can take lessons with me. I have a studio. I'm in the East Bay area. They can come to my studio or I'm doing the uh, Zoom lessons. So I have, you know, those three formats. Um, yeah. the, um, the online lessons, you know, it's like one low price. So it's like pretty reasonable. They can do a monthly thing. And I just, I put everything on there. I mean, I, I can put more, but there's a lot of stuff on there. It's like, you know, all my, sure. all my ideas and experiences through life, you know, yeah. documented. Yeah, all, all all online, <laughs> all online. For, for future generations to enjoy. Um, well, Rob, this has been amazing. Um, glad to, to, uh, spend more time with you. Uh, we, we got to hang out in person at PASIC, uh, last, last PASIC, which was great. Um, so, uh, hopefully we can hang out next time I'm out, um, towards San Francisco, which should be in June. Um, so I'll be out your way and I'll definitely let you know, but you will be back on the podcast. We'll be doing um, Scott Morris clips next time on the next episode, um, which we will we'll cover that down the road a month or two from now. We kind of spread these out. And uh, hopefully by then, I will be back up and running in my new studio space um, and not have to set up on a card table 20 minutes before our, our, our call uh, next time. So, but anyway, Rob, I appreciate you being on here, man. And, and I'm glad to have you as a returning guest and a friend uh, to me and the show and everyone who's listening. So uh, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Bart. And uh, hang in there, man. I know it's like life is hectic and crazy <laughs> with, uh, you know, having a new child, 
and yes. um, and 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 uh, trying to make everything work with when life starts to get real complicated and and I just yep. know like trying to put out a, a, a weekly podcast is it it it's so hard. I, I really appreciate how hard that is. Uh, I try to do weekly yeah. videos and it's it's like uh, I can't. It it got to be too much. I I just couldn't get yeah. it together to 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 actually. Oh, every every Monday at at twelve o'clock, there's going to be a new video. You you just get into them. Well, and now I'm doing biweekly during the setup of this thing. But but really though, it's like you can't. You just get into the mode of it, you miss a week. It's like I've always equated it to like working out, which I I, I missed a week, and then it's been ten years. But like you miss a week, <laughs> and then you stop doing it. And then you're like, well, I just I'll do it a week later. If you if you stick with it and stay regimented, but this is a crazy time. I kind of make myself feel better by saying it could not possibly get any harder than it is right now. So I'm like, it can only get easier with you know having a three month old baby and and kids, but it, it'll get easier. And uh, truly though, the show must go on. Like I I love doing this podcast so much and getting to spend time with people like you and and meeting people who listen. So uh, appreciate you saying that and. Um, I'm, I'm glad to have you on here and uh, appreciate the kind words. So, so Rob, thank you very much. And, uh, and we'll see you next time for the next episode. Thanks, Bart.